<laughs> Welcome, everybody. In anticipation of there being lots of questions, we'll get started a few minutes early. So I'm Jim Demmel. I'm the chair of ECS. And when I became chair, I never dreamed that one of my most pleasant jobs would be, announced, would be to announce that one of our colleagues had won the Turing Award. And so let me, let's all welcome Dave Patterson. So, so of course, the Turing Award is just one of the 35 or so awards Dave has won. I won't uh, give you a list of all of them. Um, but it's certainly the biggest one, the most prestigious. And it was presaged probably by a plaque that's hanging down on the third floor, which was a, uh, an IEEE Milestone 2015 Award for Risk One. And of course, now we're up to risk five. And who knows, maybe there'll be a risk six someday, but I don't know. So, uh, so, so, so let's all give David a cheer for knowing what risks to take. <laughs> so uh, the point of this little interview is to give you sort of a, a history and, and you know, talk about some uh, personal interesting things, Dave's trajectory, how he got to where he is today, the whole path. So we think of Dave as a Californian, of course, what else? But actually, he was born in Evergreen Park, Illinois, if Wikipedia is right. And, and so um, I'd sort of like to ask, how did your family decide to move all the way from Illinois to L.A.? So my uh, parents met in the suburb of Chicago. And in fact, I'm going to go give a, a talk like this uh, I'm giving this afternoon at the University of Chicago because Mike Franklin's there and they're opening a building. And all my uh, Chicago relatives are coming, so <laughs> it's a big family. But so for my parents, who were married shortly after World War II, uh, and they kind of hated the snow and the bad weather. <laughs> and plus, they wanted to move a place. They, they, it was expensive to do housing near Chicago, so they moved to a place where housing was cheap, California. <laughs> <laughs> so California kind of pioneered track housing and stucco walls with no insulation and could do really cheap houses so they could afford to come out here and get a house and got to get away from the snow. So it was a powerful combination. My grandfather served in World War II, was stationed in Chicago, uh, stationed in San Diego. And so as soon as World War II was over, he sold the house he built in Chicago and built a new house in San Diego. So that's how they got to know California and decided to come back. So I, I think of myself as, uh, I actually know a detail that few people know is I was conceived in California, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I was actually born someplace else. <laughs> okay, so, but a US citizen either way, so. So, so uh, what was, can you say a little bit more about your parents and, and their yeah. education and you know, how, what you know, sort of inspired yep. so, you to go your way there? Yeah, so my, uh, because of World War II, my dad met my mother in high school, and uh, it was, uh, and so, but my father was stationed some, my grandfather was stationed someplace else, so he, it was time to leave, but he talked him into staying with a friend so he could finish high school, and then it was time for him to leave, and he just couldn't leave my mom, and so they got married. So they got married right out of high school. He finished community college and then started going part-time to Northwestern, and then they decided to move to California. So. The whole time growing up, he was a part-time student at USC, in, which was near where he worked in downtown LA. And his joke used to be that his goal was to get a, a, a bachelor's degree before me, but <laughs> but he lost. <laughs> I got a bachelor's degree before, before he did. So I'm the first of my family to get a college education, but clearly uh, my dad was smart, but my mom was a lot smarter. <laughs> uh, sadly, it was a time where women didn't get those opportunities. Had my in today, she would be CEO of some corporation, but instead, she raised uh, a family of four. So, did you go? So, you went to UCLA, and did you go there straight away from high school? Or? I was actually admitted to UCLA, but I was a wrestler in high school, and I met. This, I had a girlfriend in high school, so when I was 17 years old, it was, should I go to UCLA or go to community college? Well, the, uh, I thought if I went to UCLA, I, I might lose my girlfriend. And the wrestling team at El Camino was actually better than UCLA's wrestling team. <laughs> and so apparently, according to my mom, it was the, some combination of the girlfriend and the wrestling. I went to a community college. And in fact, we were better. We beat UCLA. In a, <laughs> a community college of freshmen and sophomores beat, you know, uh, Arizona State and uh, UCLA, uh, which had, you know, four years of students. So we were a very good wrestling team. So that part was good, but it was a surprising decision, you know, 
scholarship wise, mm -hmm. but it worked out. We, I went to UCLA after my two years uh, at El Camino. And uh, so what about, uh, so this was in like 69 or something like that? That's when I graduated from UCLA. Okay, so there was something called the draft going on. At the there time. was the Vietnam War. Yeah, so <laughs> how, did, how did that play out? For yeah, you? so that was a, kind of at that time, Every male graduate, every male undergraduate student graduated in exactly four years, because if you had a bad semester, you'd be drafted and go to Vietnam. Uh, so that was high on everybody's list. Uh, so for me, I kind of screwed up the petition process, and so I got taken into the uh, called into the induction center in downtown Los Angeles. I was a wrestler, and in the last minute of my last match, I heard something pop in my leg, and, but I'd seen a bunch of wrestlers with big, like, Frankenstein scars, so I just kind of toughed it, and, but it was limping around some. And when I went to the draft center, uh, I had, uh, I got somebody to write a letter that said uh, uh, that I had high blood pressure, which uh, I don't know if I did, but it, uh, when they took it, I did. <laughs> and I went, and I was in good shape because of a wrestler, and you're walking around in your underwear in the draft center, and I took my letter to people to show them that I had high blood pressure, and they say, oh, uh, you've got Dr. Smith there writing that letter, who was apparently the football coach uh, uh, at UCLA who wrote anybody a letter that they were, weren't eligible for the draft. And if you had a letter from Dr. Smith, you were in. They were just going to draft you immediately because they knew it was fake. But the, what happened was, uh, for me, is uh, right before lunch, somebody said, and I had this letter about the high blood pressure, hoping that that was going to work. And uh, them, so they said, anybody else got any problems? So I said, yeah, my knee hurts. So the guy, I still remember, the guy has me sit up at the table. He measures my right leg, which was my good leg, measures the circumference of my left leg, which is my bad leg. And he wrote something out and handed it to me. And what it was was because it had, uh, I had limping, it, it had atrophied. So it was a few inches less in circumference. So I got a draft deferment. And what I started doing after that is started riding my bicycle from the married student housing at UCLA, which like here is about three miles away. So the bicycle built up my muscles and everything was okay. But for that one window of time, I had a bad leg and that kept me on the war. And, and thinking about it, you know, had I been drafted, I can't imagine I would have gone to grad school. It's just, uh, you know, serve a few years, assuming you live, you know, a, a war, uh, come back, I'm sure that would have been the end of my education if I hadn't been injured. But then you graduated and you stayed at UCLA for grad school, right? Yeah. So uh, I was, I'll skip that part. I'll, I'll, I was going to tell that story later. But basically, a, a um, faculty member took pity on me as an undergraduate student. I was working at my dad's factory to support myself and my wife at UCLA. And he, uh, I said at the end of this computer science class, boy, I'd sure rather be doing this than working mm -hmm. in a factory to go to school. And on his own, he went and found me a job as undergraduate. And I had no... Given my parents, my parents would be thrilled if I got a bachelor's degree. For them, that was the ultimate. So there was no talk about masters or anything like that. I had no plans like that. Uh, so, but he got me a job as undergraduate. I liked it. I talked to my wife. It seemed like a master's was a cost-efficient decision. It's like in three or four quarters, I get a master's degree. And so she said that was fine. And then I was put in the office with four people. All the, the other three were all getting PhDs. So that seemed like a good idea. So, <laughs> so I ended up going to graduate school. So, and your advisor was uh, uh, Gerald Estrin? Yeah, I had kind of two advisors. It was Gerald Estrin, who was Deborah Estrin's father and uh, who was just named a MacArthur fellow. Yes, and, one of our alumna. And yes. he worked... Uh, uh, the cool thing about Gerald Estrin is he worked with von Neumann at, you know, at the Institute of Advanced Studies. So I have like von Neumann stories that have been passed down, one, one level of indirection, uh, with, you know, the very roots of computing. So, so how did you get connected with that particular advisor? Was, you know, did you already know what research you wanted to do? And uh, It was, uh, I, I really liked software. That's what c captured me. And uh, he, there was a, it was a software-oriented project. Uh, but then the grant ended, and I ended up uh, working at a local company that did computers for airplanes, and that's how I learned hardware. And then the, that's what led to my dissertation topic, which is called, which is around what's called microprogramming. I'll explain that this afternoon. But it's basically computers used to have a little interpreter and a very simple, uh, a simple applied programming thing that was easy for hardware that you could build an interpretive of a normal instruction set. So my dissertation was around that. 
so so just to uh, continue the family connection, so uh, Deborah got her uh, bachelor's degree here in uh, I think 1980, and did you? I, ever... I actually because I know her since she was. I call her Debbie a lot, <laughs> and apparently. I shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> Nobody else calls her Debbie, except for these old people. Did, did you ever have her in a class? I don't. Gee, you know. <laughs> I should ask that question. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think of that. Yeah, I just thought I'd surprise you with a question. Uh, I, I, not that I remember. I think I would have okay. remembered that. Right. So uh, yeah. She avoided me, I guess. <laughs> right. And I, I should mention that uh, Deb, Deborah also just uh, is in the National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, in addition to her recent MacArthur. So a, yep. uh, someone we'll invite back to sometime soon. So, so when did you get started on sort of the big project that uh, has been going on for a long time? You know, that risk. you realize that risk was the right thing to do. Uh, I'll, I'll explain the technical things. Uh, kind of the surprising thing was um, uh, uh, Carlo Sican right here and I were working with a person who recruited, I guess, both of us here, Aldous Bain, and he was kind of a arch kind of a architecture philosopher, kind of, and thought of big ideas, and it was really great talking about them. But unfortunately, the first project I worked on as assistant professor was extraordinarily ambitious. This was in, in the mid-70s. We were going to build a computer architecture, a chip, an operating system. I, and that was the more stuff. It was called <laughs> X-Tree. And so, and we got, it was really fun to talk about it, but we actually had no resources. We had no funding and we were going to try and supposedly we we're going to do all these things. So I took, ended up taking a leave of absence because I was invited by people in Boston at a mini computer company to come work on microprograms. And it gave me time to stop and think, you know, like uh, pause, like, is this working well? And, and then the question I asked myself, well, how do you get work done in university since there's no deadlines? And I thought, <laughs> uh, well, you know, if you tied courses, there's, dead, there's real deadlines. There are courses. Courses stop and stop. So if you could tie the research to the courses, then uh, you could have deadlines and people would make progress. And so I came back and Carlo, remember better than I, right after sabbatical and said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this thing. Uh, I, I remember what, part of what happened. It was Bob Broderson, uh, our colleague who was getting DARPA funding. And I would talk, we would both talk to him about ideas. And Bob finally asked me, Dave, what do you really want to do? <laughs> I, was I was trying to say all these things I thought other people want to do. What do you want to do? Oh, I want to build a computer. He says, why don't you do that? <laughs> and so I think between that and then the kind of some of the experiences about this, why are, do we have a, why, are, why does it make sense to have an interpreter inside a computer? Why don't we just not have an interpreter? Those ideas were kind of in the air at the time. There was this 801 project that you could hear rumors about. So uh, we thought we would build uh, you know, uh, a chip Right, and that led to uh, the risk one and risk two, and what we now call risk three and risk four. Uh, uh, what actually happened? They had other names, but people asked me if I had any regrets, and I said, you know, we should have called them risk three and risk four. We had a good brand there, and so when I told that to the students, uh, when they were that Krista, I don't know, was that your decision, Krista, to call it risk five? <laughs> Probably, yeah. So the, uh, kind of for historical reasons, they called it risk five, correcting the thing that I wish I had done. Uh, so that's why I uh, worked on, so it's kind of 1980s was the risk stuff, and then since 2010 is risk five. And, you know, my name gets associated, but Krista Sonovich absolutely led it. And then the two gr star grad students, Andrew Waterman and, and Yen Sup Lee, mm -hmm. they, they, they made that happen. I, I gave wise advice, I guess. <laughs> so, so speaking of wonderful students, you've had three who've won the doc ACM Doctoral Dissertation Award, which might be a record, I'm not sure. But, uh, but yeah, so I'm just sort of wondering, you know, and, and just so that everybody knows who they are, there's Garth Gibson, who got it for working on RAID. He's now a faculty member at Carnegie Mellon. And there's Manolas Katvenis, who worked on RISC-2, and he's a professor in Crete. And there's David Ungar, who did it for small talk. So that's your uh, software side of things. And he's now at IBM Research. So, so when you, you know, think about how you create such wonderful groups and, and students, was it, did you, you know, guide them very closely or did you just step back and watch them flower independently on their own? Or how did, you know, yeah, how, did how, I did, do how that? did that all work? Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I think I always thought was, well, if you can get into Berkeley graduate school, I don't think I, I couldn't have gotten to Berkeley Graduate School. If you can get to Berkeley Graduate School, 
you're really good. Mm -hmm. right? So these are like future colleagues. And the thing I get some credit for is trying to create projects, these five-year projects that are so exciting that if I was a grad student, I'd just do anything to get in that project. Mm -hmm. I had to, and it's got a vision. And the thing that happened when I got here, I, Carlo, uh, maybe, I hope they still say this to us as professors, uh, but was hit me was we don't count papers. We count impact. Your job here is to have big impact. And I love that. I, oh yeah, that's what I want to do. I don't want to write a lot of papers. I want to have impact. And so we try and do five-year projects that, you know, we swing for the fences. If this project is successful, this could, you know, have this giant impact. So I, and I, if I was a grad student and I heard about a project that was trying to do that, I would find that irresistible. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we do multidisciplinary projects, people, lots of areas. So the education comes from, uh, the faculty in other areas and the grad students in other areas working together. So it's it's a very, I think it's a very effective ecosystem to produce great grad students. Mm -hmm. So rather than I'm such a fantastic advisor. <laughs> <laughs> So, so uh, these these uh, the three folks I mentioned, Garth, Manolis, and David, worked in really kind of different areas. You know, so there was you know uh, uh, arrays of uh, independent disks and, and risk and and small talk. So these reflect the three different projects that they were involved with, three different five year projects. Yeah, uh, I think what we do here, you know, one of uh, what was interesting to me was I had your chair last week and asking uh, Shafi and Silvio, you know, why. Well, why is this such a place in rich in Turing Awards? And they brought up uh, the community, right, mm -hmm. working together and the, and the support system. And I think that's kind of consistent with what the system side, mm -hmm. uh, too, is the uh, what we do is look for exciting problems. What are technological mm -hmm. trends over the next five to ten years? If What new opportunities do they present? Mm -hmm. And then work to help make them happen. Mm -hmm. So that's why there were, I guess, the sequence was kind of a lot of risk projects, including parallel processing. Mm -hmm. And then the next one after that was with Randy Katz was the RAID project where mm -hmm. if processes are really fast, what are we gonna do about AO? And look, there's these mm -hmm. new small disks and PCs. What happens if you put a lot of them together? And then I think right after that was the Networker Workstations project, which was, uh, hey, um, uh, how, it's really expensive to build a supercomputer. What would happen if we use the workstations on our desks and uh, connected them with a off the shelf but faster network? How good a computer could that mm -hmm. be? Uh, but and all every time that we did one of these things, it involved three or four or five faculty with different mm -hmm. areas of expertise coming together and creating those kind of ecosystems. So the small talk one was uh, was one of the risk projects. It was a small risk three is small talk on risk. So that's what one of the oh okay okay. So, so of course, your collaborations have gone beyond Berkeley, and and there's a famous textbook uh, that goes back a long way. So you even collaborate with people at Stanford, and so and and you even share prizes with people at Stanford. So, 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 actually, thinking about your textbook, I, I do have a question: How did you and John Hennessy decide who would write which part of it? So, uh, well, let me tell you a little bit of the story, which you'll appreciate, Jim. Is you know when you uh, haven't had a uh, an academic position. The first academic administrative position is chair. And so when you haven't had one of those. Maybe you should use my mic while he's fixing. My <laughs> okay, so if you haven't had a position like this, you think life is over once you become chair. Maybe that's accurate now. Uh, but uh, you, uh, but you, I, that's what I fully expected. So John and I, uh, I, you know, I, I recognized that John was a really brilliant <laughs> and, a, and a nice guy. And we kind of had a common worldview. When we did the risk stuff, because we're at Stanford and Berkeley, we could have decided they were the enemy, right? But fortunately, we decided, you know, we're on the same side of the argument. There's us two and everybody else in the world. So we collaborated in advocating for risk, and we really hated the textbooks. The textbooks were kind of like Sears catalogs of, of lists of things. So we said, oh, let's work on the textbook. And then I said, oh, my God, I think I'm going to become chair <laughs> next year. This is it. My life will be over. We have to write right now. So that was the, the chair. Chairmanship was the deadline. And we, and we wrote the book in about nine months and got it done just before. And I was right. I, I did become chair and, and got it done. And the decision of what to do, uh, um, we alternated. I don't know. We, we did half of the chapters. And John's better at compilers than I am. So that was natural. I'm good at, you know, 
I think the introductions were a good thing for me to do, the, uh, the kind of setting the context. And, and I liked doing the cash stuff. Uh, so we just alternated that way. And then we did subsequently when we do revisions, it's on the sixth edition, we would take turns on chapters. And now it's pretty vague who did what. <laughs> now it's some mixture of both of our writing over 30 years or something. So, so how many universities use that? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Hundreds. I think we, I, I think it's, you know, a, a, a large fraction of a million copies of that book in the undergraduate book. Oh, I think. Okay. So, so, uh, I'd like to let other people ask questions here shortly, but I do want to have one last question before opening it up, which is one of your 35 awards is, and I'm just sort of wondering how you, you know, you know where your time came to do this one. This was the 2013 American powerlifting record for the state of California <laughs> for his weight class and age group in the bench press, deadlift, squat, and all three combined lifts. So, so I'm just wondering where you find yeah. the time. <laughs> Yeah, so, so my uh, joke about that is when people say, well, why, how the hell did Dave Patterson get a Turing Award? And you can all say, Dave Patterson is by far the strongest Turing Award winner. <laughs> <laughs> He's an award winning, uh, yeah. So uh, it was actually tied to the Berkeley classes. So uh, as teaching 61C in courses like that, we talked about the importance of metrics and stuff like that. So I had, as a wrestler, and I'd kept lifting weights all these years, I thought it'd be kind of, my joke was, well, clearly the proper metric for strength is you take how much you can bench press multiplied by your age. It's clearly a fair <laughs> metric. And so, wow, that guy, that 20 year old, that person can bench press 400 pounds. Yeah, but he's only 20 years old. You know, mm. Here I was 50. So then I thought that'd be a funny thing to I say in the classes. And then I said, I know what I'll do. I'll put weightlifting records in. Mm -hmm. and, and I plotted them and I said, uh, I think I'd be competitive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I show up, uh, my son came with me and I show up at one of these competitions with people built like brick houses. Uh, uh, and uh, and the, the first category I won, I won several awards like novice, novice uh and then the actual i won my competition and then i won the category of people who who won who had promised that they hadn't taken steroids in at least five years <laughs> <laughs> so that was my favorite one and it turns out yeah so it turns out you know at my age and weight and strength i was i was pretty strong and then the other part of the story is i thought i was in, entering a, for that one i was entering a bench pressing competition. Now that's all, that's what I, but I was pretty good at that, but it turned out there were three events. So I had to enter the other two. Uh, and, uh, and I'm usually in, in bench pressing, there's somebody in a competition, they give you three tries. And because I'd never done it before, what everybody else does is do is a safe weight and then do something really hard in case they do it. And then kind of a medium weight for me, the first time, strike one. <laughs> nope, you didn't do it right. Strike two, you didn't write right. And I would finally do it on the third one. And so uh, it was. I had a very exciting competition. <laughs> okay. So uh, let me open the floor to questions. If anybody else would like to ask uh, anything about, uh, you know, you know the grad old, school, grad school. You know, the the five worst ways to run a project. All those other things. Dave is good at giving adv advice on. I'll try and give shorter answers. So. Yes. We just need the first question. Okay. <laughs> Easier while well, in grad school. Grad school is a very stressful time. Uh, uh, I still remember the anxiety about picking a topic. And in my, my family, my, my parents were very supportive, but my parents-in-law were less so. It was like, uh, I was the first one to get a bachelor's degree, so they asked me how long to take a PhD. I thought it was like in the medical degrees. Four years. It takes four years to get a, uh, a degree. I had no idea. So in my seventh year, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was apparently there, there was a phrase used in my in-law's family, which is if somebody goes to school for there, it's pulling a Dave. <laughs> So, and so the funny, and then following up on that story, like 15 years ago, my, one of my nieces got married and this person had got a MBA and then a law degree and my sister-in-law referred to him as pulling a Dave. <laughs> still, that's still a thing in their family. Uh, so it was, it was pretty stressful. I, wife with two kids, uh, you know, trying to support them in an RA salary. Um, my wife and I look back 
with happiness at those times. We know we can be happy without any money. Uh, once you get your degree, you think of the good old days, what it was like when you, when you only had to finish your degree, you only had one thing you had to worry about. But, you know, it's a stressful time. The thing I did well is, I, and I still do, I need to do uh, physical exercises. I need to have something for fun. Uh, I would strongly encourage you not to take up so much time that you don't have time to have fun. Uh, as people get to be adults, they stop playing games and stuff like that. I, I, I still play soccer twice a week, ride my bike everywhere. Uh, and uh, it, you make sure you have fun because research isn't like delivering a product, right? It's this unclear path, how you get there and inspiration, bumping into people with ideas. It's, it's not, you know, just sitting in your, in your office with your head down on your laptop, uh, lots of days, lots of days a week, isn't necessarily the best way uh, to get the best results. So, uh, you know, interacting, doing this. I think that we're going to have a Manuel Blum here in, uh, Two weeks, two weeks, next week, next week, next week. He's the best uh, PhD mentor I've ever seen. Um, what he would have his students do, I still remember, is as long as you're at Berkeley, you're going to take a course every semester. So his theory students would take one course a semester thinking, if you're working on your dissertation, you got time for one course and, and, and would do that. So uh, I would ask that question for Manuel because he, I mean, he, he has, besides <laughs> several faculty here like Umish, uh, of his former students, you know, Turing Award winners is his former student. So he, he's, he's the guy I would get the advice from, not me. So since you're still playing soccer uh, twice a week, it's good to hear that your knee healed from your injury a long time ago. So Yeah, I wear a brace still, but <laughs> okay. uh, okay. yes, that hasn't stopped me. Great. Any more questions? Oh, there's got to be more questions. I'll start asking you questions. Back there. Uh, so you're uh, you're looking forward to academic opportunities, and and what, what should you do? Uh, I have this talk about how to have a bad career. <laughs> uh, it's it's which it's you know it's a whole talk on that. Um, and the advice I'll give this afternoon. First of all, uh, you know I I uh, decided to try and maximize personal happiness. Um, uh, in you grow up in America, you think wealth equals happiness, but those are two independent targets. Um, so I uh, would, you know, so for me, and part of that was family first. I had a wife and kids. And so I had some time be between when I got the job offer and came to think about it. And I was going to, no matter what, family was going to be first. And that was a really good decision because when you come into this thing, people are Everybody asks you to do things, and and there's nobody nobody's managing you to tell you what to do. So you keep saying yes to stuff, uh, and you can make your family you know in tenth place. And if you have success and lose your family, it's that is not uh, a way to happiness. And you know it it's easy to do. So I would if you have a significant other or, or, or you're fortunate enough to have kids and stuff like that, you got to make them absolutely top priority because people will unintentionally kind of get you to push that uh, uh, towards the end. Uh, you know, academics, you know, there's the, I went into it because you have this chance to influence people. I read this book uh, before I got my PhD called Working, where he interviewed people in lots of categories. What I got out of that book at the end of their careers, you know, when they look back, the people who built things that lasted forever, like the Golden Gate Bridge, were pretty happy with things, and people who worked with people, like priests or teachers. And so, you know, and what they felt was, I had, you take tremendous pride in seeing people in your classes go on and do great things. That, that's a real satisfaction, felt like that was a, a career well spent. Uh, so I think it's a great opportunity there. You know, there's probably more opportunity to make money, especially today in industry, it feels like, you know, it used to be, I don't know, factors of two or three difference. It feels like it might be even bigger difference now, but you know, once you get a certain amount of money so that you can live okay, it's it's kind of it's not so clear what you do with ten times or a hundred times that much money. The, I've gotten to know billionaires, mm -hmm. so having your own private plane so you don't have to wait in line at the airport is pretty cool. But it's not that cool. <laughs> it's not it's not that bad. It's not you know I, I got to wait like twenty minutes in line. You know so yeah so I I would say you know the wealth thing uh, as I reflect. 
back in my career, I'm really happy, you know, with my decisions. I don't wish I had a lot more money. Uh, and it's kind of surprising. This, there's, you know, how much can you do with a lot more money, right? How big a house do you want to have? How, how many? Uh, what else can you spend the money on? And that's why they become philanthropists because it's not that much you can do with it. So, uh, so I think, yeah, I, I, I would do that, and then f figure out what's really great about where you're going to go and what works well there and not. I think I was clearly uh, blessed to be able to come to Berkeley, you know, and it had a culture of community, you know, cl collaboration. We're near Silicon Valley. If I'd ended up in some other part of the country, I don't think I could have done the same projects, but I would like to think I would try to think, well, what, what's good? What can I, what is str the strengths here? Is it my colleagues or industry and what's, what can you do well there, uh, not that you might not be able to do at other places? Right, what do I look for? So for me, I use you know kind of the sports analogies, but I think any kind of thing that you're involved in that involves a bunch of people working together successfully could work. So I think band or symphonies could work, being in plays, anytime where a group of people have to come together and be successful is uh, where you could pick up uh, an analogy. So you're looking for team players. You're looking for people who can get along with others, willing to, uh, do what's best for the team rather than what's best for individuals. So that's what you're looking for. Um, not everybody, you know, uh, not everybody is good at that, right? Um, there's people who, uh, and in fact, what's kind of frustrating for me, we have this tremendous tradition and, and produce great results and great students. They rarely replicate the Berkeley experience there. And I think, you know, it, what happens uh, for us is we really believe, I think we genuinely believe that working in a group will lead to the best research. I think, you know, so we want to do give our best effort to the joint projects. And I think other people, well, I can get my paper into my favorite conference every year if I keep giving this, and I'll spend you know, like one graduate student on multidisciplinary stuff or collaboration stuff. So, so but yeah, I would look for team players, you know, people who, uh, you know, we'll pitch in and uh, do the right thing, team, and, you know, not uh, people who, uh, you know, are, are not prima donnas, people who will, uh, um, don't have, you know, inflated egos. Unfortunately, in academia, you know, it's, it's, uh, hard it, to find. well, no, <laughs> no, I don't think it's hard to find. I think, I think our department's done a pretty good job of not having very many prima donnas. I think our, either our, uh, recruiting process or our behavior, like don't act, you know, people, senior people say don't act that way, or the role models. I don't think we have a lot of those, but academia has a lot of those. <laughs> Somehow people feel the need to act like a jerk to show people are that they're special. And so, yeah, you're special, all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, I, you kind of, and you, you try and figure that out before you, you start working with them, right? You try and uh, observe them and do small things together and see if they're willing to pitch in. So one last question. I think we have to end at one. Please. No, we don't have to end at one. Oh, we don't. Oh. I'm in charge of this. We actually okay. have, right? Okay. Bennett, we got more time. Okay. If, there's, if it's useful, going. we'll keep going. If not, we'll stop. Yes, yeah, so, uh, me? Yeah, when I was a grad student, uh, I as a student, I was not an early morning person. I would stay up late all the time. Then I had kids. <laughs> and the kids, kids wake up at all kinds of times. So I became an early morning person, and that's who I am now. I, uh, it, that's actually, if you have a family and you become an early morning person, that's a pretty good time. I don't know, Krista, you, are you early morning or late still? Yeah, <laughs> Krista, who late in life had a kid, is now an he used to be a very late at night person, but a time when your family's not around so you can concentrate um, is really important. And so uh, I think uh, in studies of productivity is, you know, if you're trying to do something creative, you, if you can do a couple of hours a day of real concentration without distractions, that's fantastic. You can't do that eight hours a day, a few hours a day. So you need to protect that time. I, what I have seen is, for most people, it's usually late at night or early in the morning where they can get that protected time. And then what you want to do is do not answer email. 
during your most productive time of the day, right? Or anything else like that. Do all that other stuff at other times. For me, it worked out well. All the, all the writing happened, uh, you know, I was in my uh, bathrobe <laughs> for the writing that I do, getting up early in the morning and do stuff. Well, <laughs> ah, great. <laughs> I like telling stories. So as a freshman, I was young and kind of small statured, so it was 103. And then by when I was a senior, I did, wrestled 130. And then when I went to the community college with these really great wrestling team, uh, they had nobody could wrestle 160. Nope, there was, they didn't have 160. And they had like state champions at all the other weights. So I said, okay, I'll wrestle 160. So I got to wrestle my whole freshman year and I didn't have to cut weight. I, it was just my, my natural weight was less than 160. So I got beat a lot. <laughs> but I think my, my saving grace is our arch rival match uh, was uh, at the last in the season and I had lost a lot since I was a lot weaker than the guys I was wrestling with. But my coach fired me up uh, and, you know, this is the big match, you know, rah, rah, and got us going. And I, uh, I won, the people thought I would be pinned, which is the, you know, this guy getting knocked out. I think they were worried I'd get pinned in, the, in our big rival match, but instead I hung on and won. And I can still remember, it was so surprising. I won three, two. It was so surprising that the rest of the team came and lifted me up on my shoulders and carried me off the mat. <laughs> so it was, they were so shocked that I won the match against the <laughs> arch rival. But then my sophomore year, I, I was a lot, I was pretty good, uh, but I'd grown into it. But it was pretty cool growing into uh, not having, wrestling without cutting weights a lot more fun. I'm still married. <laughs> Unless you know something, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, yeah, my wife pretty much, uh, she, she raised the kids until they were, you know, middle school age, and then she went back to art school. So, she, you know, that was, I was fortunate uh, that uh, she was willing to do that. It's a lot harder uh, when both, you know, when two people have full-time jobs. And building bridges with, yeah, I, 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 we're supposed to be repeating these questions. I remember it now. <laughs> Joh Johan asked, uh, uh, we've built bridges to industry. I, I thought, I think for some reason, maybe it's from Gerald Estrin, is, uh, uh, is I've been pretty good about getting feedback. And so it just struck me, right at, even from the first risk project, is we would invite people from industry to give us feedback on our ideas. Because here are these experts, they're 30 miles away come visit and give us feedback. So I think from pretty early in my career, we would use industry as feedback. Then uh, Dave Hodges, when he was dean of the College of Engineering, started a program that was funded by the state of California called the Micro Program, which would do matching. That if companies would give money, the state would match it, which comp companies love getting their money matched. They, they love that idea. So that went us from getting feedback to trying getting funding from them. And so we, that happened uh, for a long time until it was canceled. Then the big thing that happened to us, because after the risk project, we were able to get DARPA funding, which is, you know, big funding, is that when George W. Bush became um, president, he appointed uh, a brother-in-law of his vice president, Tony Tether, to be in charge of DARPA, who wasn't a fan of academic research. And so we went from, yeah, I don't know, 15 years of DARPA funding to zero. And so, uh, you know, so we had, so Rand, I remember talking to Randy Katz and Randy Katz and I said, well, either we're gonna retire early, take advantage of the retirement system, uh, or we're gonna find a new way to do funding. We, well, why, let's write to NSF, we thought. Well, everybody else came to that same conclusion and wrote to NSF. <laughs> and so I still remember when Mike Jordan said, uh, told me I'd never gotten an NSF proposal turned down and he went one for six and I thought, ah, the world has changed. Mm -hmm. So we decided to go to, because of our longtime collaboration with industry and say, look, 
you like projects like these that, you know, lots of students produce them, you know, we're going to need to, hit, you know, do industrial fundraising. And we went to uh, Microsoft and Google and places like that and asked for a half a million dollars a year, I think. Yeah, I think a half a million dollars a year of support if you want to do projects like this. And they had an allergic reaction to the idea. And I said, wait a minute, it's not a half million dollars a year for Dave Patterson. It's a half million dollars a year for Dave Patterson and Mike Jordan and uh, and Jan Stoika. So like there's five or six of people you're funding. Oh, that's not so, so bad. So we said, and if, you know, you don't have to fund it, but we're, don't expect us to keep producing students like we've been producing because we can't do big projects like that. We'll never get that money from NSF. And so... Uh, they went for it, and in fact, uh, when the Rad Lab got started, which was the first one to do that, they uh, the kind of the New York Times was uh, article was I think uh, what was it Google and Microsoft agree on something, <laughs> 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 which was the fund uh, fund us, and then and I, I thought at the time you know uh, if we figure and we did figure out to do the funding, and what was really interesting is we thought maybe they want patents, maybe that's what they want. What they really wanted was our students, right? But they weren't willing to just give us money for any old project. They had, you know, the research had to be provocative enough that if it worked, it'd be interesting. But like that was 51%, 49% was the students, producing great students because companies need, need to hire. So we, that, we figured that out. And I still remember thinking then is that, you know, once we figure out industrial funding, if the DARPA famine ends, we're not going to forget how to do industrial funding. And so ever since that point from the Rad Lab, we've had, you know, really substantial funding. It reminds me, you know, it reminds me I always used to, uh, at MIT with Mike Dertuzos, who was a tremendous fundraiser, they would always get these projects and ah, Dertuzos did it again. <laughs> you get millions of dollars from industry for projects that I don't know how important they were. Uh, but so now MIT must say that about us. <laughs> ah, those Berkeley guys got more industrial funding. How did they do that? You know, so we're, I think we're the, we're the best at it now. Would, would you think we're the best at industrial funding now, which is, which is, you know, that's a big, that's a pretty big change. <laughs> that, there's my short answer to your question. You know. <laughs> but I think, it, but you know, we're, if you're trying to have impact, you need to talk to industry, right? It's, it's you. Now you don't want to do what they tell you to do. You don't go to them and say, what should we work on? They'll, that's, they're not good at that. Uh, they're unlikely to give you an important 10 year vision to do that, but understanding what their problems are and you figure out what that is. And then getting, as you develop the ideas, you get feedback along the way that we do these retreats twice a year, you get feedback. They're invaluable for stuff, stuff like that. And they also, if you're fortunate, can, can fund some of this, uh, work, which, uh, you know, we, which is very helpful. Okay, pause. All right. I think we should declare victory here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, good job. Good job.